<laughs> oh, my beloved brother. <laughs> Hello, Church of the Living God. <laughs> it's 11.39 a.m. my time. Good morning. My beloved brother, my dear friend from the Northwest. <laughs> Uh, you, you know who you are. Um, this is, yes, as, um, as you called me, I had just, always seems to work that way, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, of a like mind, of a like mind. There are those of us within the Church of the Living God who seem to get along more better than we do with others. That is because we are of a like mind. There are those of the Church of the Living God in where we are not like-minded in some things and hence no fellowship there. Even though we may agree and believe and teach and preach the same principles, but there's a lack of like-mindedness there. And that's what we're going to talk about, of a like mind. There are very few of the Church of the Living God who um, I am like-minded with, myself personally, and with my wife. The two are one flesh. Uh, for example, um, our best friend, Brother Alexander Hartley, we are of a like mind. We are of a like mind. Uh, we are very like-minded. Um, also with a, um, a dear brother from Australia, also very like-minded, quite like-minded. And there are several others out there who uh, we are personally like-minded with. Um, but there are some out there that we are not, who are of the Church of the Living God. Um, wouldn't want to have even 10, 10 seconds of their time of a day but uh, of the Church of the Living God. But what say the scriptures about being like-minded? What say the scriptures? Get your authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures, and turn in your authorized version of the scriptures. Follow me along. It's important that you do so. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to very simply read verses to begin, verses 10 on to verse 12. And we're going to see that the scriptures have quite a bit to say about being like-minded. But something happens within brethren where that like-mindedness gets bent or gets diluted. And we're going to look at that too. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 on to verse 12. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, look at this, and in the same judgment. In the same judgment. Now, there is a trivial saying out there that, and it is, it's been made trivial, I should say. Um, it's been made trivial by Christians, of course, that when God made you, he broke the mold. Well, that is true. Yes. Praise the Lord, there is only one of me. <laughs> Praise the Lord, there's only one of you. You might have a doppelganger in looks, but uh, praise the Lord, we are unique because God is a God of variety. See, God does not want, the term is called, cookie-cutter Christians, that you come, 
come stamped out of the same mold, being the same. But we are to be, what does it say? Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Does that mean that we all have the same dialect? Does that mean that we all sound the same? No. What does that mean? Speak the same thing. Because we have, we apparently have the same father, right? We apparently believe the scriptures, apparently. So hence, in us speaking the same thing, it correlates unto what? Unto our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, and unto the scriptures, that we speak the same things in light of Christ. Okay? And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and, th and this is what ties us all together, and in the same judgment. The same judgment. How do you judge? I first examine myself and judge myself according to the scriptures. What do you judge? And how do you judge? By your feelings? By tradition? Or by the scripture? By the scripture! what you want to apply and what you don't want to apply. Hmm? Hold your place. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 on to verse 16. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 on to verse 16. Now, Romans chapter 12 is written on to who? Church of the living God, unto those who are saved, born again, converted, new creatures in Christ Jesus. Okay? This is written for us. Okay? So, Romans 12, verses 9 on to verse 16. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Abhor means what? Extreme hatred. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Dear friend, if you prefer the company of the lost world, <clears throat> that's a problem. That's a problem, and you need to check yourself. That's a big problem. Because it says right here, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. Who is my brother? Those who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Many can take the name, right? Many have taken the name. Oh, we're Christians. Yeah? Are you a new creature? Oh, you got to change life, huh? Oh, that's good for you. Are you a new creature? See, because many people can change their lives, can have a changed life. There's something totally different of being a new creature. So when it says, be kindly one, be kindly affection one toward another with brotherly love. Who is my brother? Who is my brother? Because you say you're a Christian, right? Okay. Are you a new creature? Do we have a like mind? Who is God? Is he one God comprised of spirit, soul, and body? Or is he one God comprised of three divine persons? And a person is what? A spirit, soul, and body? Do we have the same mind? Do we have the same mind when it comes in regards to judgment? Now, what affects that of our judgment? We'll get to that in a bit, but let's continue. Who is my brother again? Someone who is saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus of the church of the living God. 
You could say all day to your chartreuse in the face, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Jesus is the Lord. All that proves is that you can say it. Bravo. Someone who is my brother is someone who has come to the Lord on his terms, not his own. On the terms of our Lord, broken of their self-righteousness. Having godly sorrow, contrition. And in fear of the Lord, called upon his name. And the Lord saved him. That is my brother or my sister. And it says here, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. I prefer to be with those of my own kind, those who are of the church of the living God, okay? And it's in regards to fellowship, okay? I'm not going to hang out, as it were, with lost people. Well, no way. <laughs> it's like, that's like a, taking a, a spark to gasoline. It ain't going to work, see? So let's continue. Not slothful in business, fervent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord in whatever capacity it is that he has called you to serve him in, whatever it is. Rejoicing in hope, the blessed hope, the hope that you and I, sooner or later, we are going to be redeemed, caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. If you don't know about the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, if you're ignorant, that's one thing. If you are denying it and against it, you're a heretic. You're a heretic. Okay? <laughs> and to you who say, well, there is no catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. <laughs> you say that Christians are going to go through the great tribulation, and I agree with you. You're right. Christians are going to be going through the great tribulation. Absolutely. Absolutely. But those who are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, new creatures in Christ Jesus, we're going up. Whether I think you are or not of the church of the living God, and you are, whether I like you or not. But if you are truly saved, born again, converted, you're going up. Let's continue. Rejoicing in hope, patience in tribulation, because with patience brings what? Experience, and experience brings what? Hope. Continuing instant in prayer. Instant in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Pray at the spur of the moment. Do you do that? We do. Disp distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. How, how quick are you to open your door unto a brother? How quick are you to extend your hand to a brother or a sister? Or are you too good for that, huh? You're too good for that, right? Yeah. What about this? Distributing to the necessity of saints. The need. Not the greed, the need. Hmm. Wants are many, needs are few. Bless them which persecute you. How do you bless those, and we've covered this before, how do you bless those who uh, persecute you? Oh, thank you for persecuting me. Oh, thank you, bless you. No. Is not the word of God a blessing to receive? Is not the truth lovely? Is not Jesus Christ the way, the truth, and the life? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How beautiful and how precious is truth to you. Absolute truth. The authorized version. Hmm? Bless them with which persecute you. How do you bless those who persecute you? Tell them the truth. 
Share with them the gospel. Share with them the scripture. Share with them truth. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Someone who's persecuting you, Lord, please open their eyes that they may come to salvation, that they may come to you broken, contrite, and call upon you in fear of you, Lord. Then again, the opposite to that is if someone, like a lot of the Jesuits and coadjutors, who have already made their choice, <laughs> Lord, your judgment be upon them. Do you realize that a life spent in wickedness, if the Lord decides to take that person out of the way, could be a blessing? Brad, that's cold-hearted to say that. Well, think about it. Let me give you an example. You children who have an abusive father who beats you for no reason, who beats up your mother, who will have nothing to do with Christ. A life lived in wickedness and the Lord takes him out of the way. You know, brethren, you, you do have to remember that our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, he, he, he will kill people. You do know that, right? I know a lot of you like to dispute that because those of you who preach this ecumenical poison, the love gospel, God loves everybody, God wouldn't squash a fly. <laughs> have you read the Old Testament before? Oh, that's the Old Testament, not the New. We like the red words. Oh, what about the red words in the book of Revelation? <laughs> the red word Christians, by the way, you, you, you hammer them with the red words in Revelation. See them squirm. See them squirm. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is a God of justice. Is a God of judgment. He is known by his judgment. Remember that. Remember that. Okay? But verse 14 again. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Don't curse. Be careful about cursing others. With curse words or, Lord, I hope, I hope you kill this guy. We ask for his judgment. Because if you go around and start saying, oh, I hope God kills this guy. You might say, well, that's what Paul did. He said to hand one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Hand him over to Satan that God will judge him for his wickedness and let Satan act as the tool of judgment in his hand. Okay, that's what we ask for. For God's judgment. All right. And upon the wicked, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Can you be joyful when a brother is blessed and does better than what you do and gets more than what you have? Can you be happy that there is someone out there who might be your equal? Who might be being used of the Lord? Can you be joyful for that? Or do you get jealous? Do you get threatened? I love to see my brethren. I love to see them blessed of our Lord. I love to see the brethren blessed. I love to see the brethren succeed. I love when the brethren, sisters, share, share. You know, when I talk to you personally, what do I say? Tell me how the Lord has blessed you. Tell me how the Lord has blessed you. Don't tell me how you're blessed in the Lord. Tell me how he has done, not what you have done because of him. There's a difference. And look at this one right here. And weep with them that weep. Oh, you're willing to weep when it comes close to home, right? Kind of like what the accusation of uh, Lucifer towards Job. 
Skin for skin, yea. All that a man hath will he give for his life. But touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you. Oh, well, brother, that I'm really sorry that happened to you. I'm really... And they start crying because their a loved one is going, uh, is going to be going home or something like that. Or they've lost everything. It's like, oh, brother. Well, you know, brother, it's, uh, we got, it's supposed to be that. Yeah, yeah, you open your mouth like, jo uh, like Job's friends and make it worse because you're going to preach to him a sermon, right? When most of the times you just need to shut up and be there. I don't know about you, but I've wept for the for the brethren. I've wept, and my wife have have wept for those who have turned on us and attacked us. There's a brother of ours out north from out northeast, um, who's going through. Um, and keep him in your prayers, please. Our brother from uh, our brother from New Jersey and his family, please keep them in your prayers. They need it going through uh, quite a time of suffering right now. We wept for them, and we do weep for them. Why? Because we are like-minded. We have the same Father. We are of a like mind, and we weep for them. Can you do that? Or do you secretly in your hearts like, oh, better than you than me? Lord rebuke you. You're of the church of the living God and you have that in your heart with a, well, better you than me. And yes, we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that. And yes, we know that that's glorious. We know that it's better. But we are to rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. When someone of the church of the living God, brethren, sisters, comes to you when they have just lost someone. Yes, they're saved in the church of the living God. They're with the Lord. They need to grieve. Hush. Just hush and be there for them. If the Lord will give you opportunity or something to speak, speak that. But otherwise, shut up. Verse 16, be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Those who are hurting, those who are downtrodden, those who have a lot less than you. Be not wise in your own conceits. Good for you, you've been used to the Lord mightily. You gotta go, you gotta go through a rundown all the time. Be not wise in your own conceits. Condescend to men of low estate. Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. See, being of a like mind. Why? Because you are my brother. You are my sister. Okay. We have a like mind. Now go back to 1 Corinthians. Okay. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Let's reread -re verse 10 again. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 on to verse 7. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Self-sacrifice, which is charity. 
For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, don't neglect the Old Testament, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience, the God of patience, note that, and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. Grant you to be like-minded. Grant you to be like-minded. So wait a minute. Being of like mind? Being of a like mind, if it's granted to you, given to you, something could also be there that would maybe inhibit or prohibit that granting of being like mind? Really? You mean we could mess up? We, you and I, because of the skin suit, we could mess up being like-minded? Oh, gee, you don't say. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at that. Let's continue, though. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Christ received you. You didn't receive him. When you came to him on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, called upon his name, and he received you. He received you. We are to receive others of the church of the living God, our brethren, in the same way. See, that's showing love towards brothers, towards brethren. We show love to the lost by telling them the truth. If we didn't love the lost, we'd say, hey, yeah, keep keep running for that cliff. Yeah, keep running. Yeah. But see, we love the lost in that we tell them of the truth. That's how you show love unto your enemies. But when your enemy has made his choice, that's a different story. But see, like-mindedness. Paul is admonishing us again. But what, what is taking and what, are, what have we seen in like-mindedness so far? Condescending to men of low estate, preferring one another, edifying your neighbor onto edification. Okay? Also, what does it say here? Verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Charity, self-sacrifice, not charity to puff up yourself, not charity done just so you can get a reward. That's pretentious. No. Charity out of love for your brother or sister because you have a like mind. First Corinthians chapter 10, uh, 1. Verse 10 again, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 on to verse 16. But God hath revealed them unto us by his capital S, Spirit. For this capital S, Spirit, searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the lowercase s, Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. See, what makes... When I'm, you know, with those whom I trust, whom I love, my friends, my brethren, my sisters, what makes us have fellowship is that like-mindedness. Right here. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. We have the same Spirit. We are of the same mind. See. An example. These devil coadjutors. Remember. Remember. Satan is a counterfeit, 
and he wants to counterfeit and imitate everything that truly is genuine of the Lord. So when you see these coadjutors, they are also of the same mind. But their father is Satan, see. That's why you got somebody who has a little pet, a little pet boy toy doing his dirty work for him. Why? They're of the same mind. Okay? The devils are of the same mind, more often than not. But we have the church of the living God, why aren't we always of the same mind? If we have the same Father, if we have the same Spirit, right? Someone disagrees with you, they're lost! No, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not a pontificate or anything like that. No, many disagree with me and that's good. Fine, that's fine. We can disagree. But if we're of the same spirit, even in disagreement, what brings us together? The scriptures. The scriptures, spirit of truth. Because we have God the Father living within us. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. And who is the little G God of this world? Oh, that's Lucifer, by the way. But that spirit, which is of God, note the lowercase s, something that he has given us himself, okay? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost, Lord is that spirit, teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Yeah, a lot of people can get head knowledge, but see, when it comes to brethren, comparing spiritual, the Lord is that spirit, God within you, with spiritual, the things that are of the scriptures. The dividing line, dear brethren, is how we adhere ourselves to the scriptures. Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Natural, not regenerate, not born again, not a new creature. Natural, earthly. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. How do you judge things? Through the Scriptures. Not your feelings. Not, well, we've always done it this way. It's always been like this. Not by man's traditions, no. <laughs> to hell with your traditions. What say the scripture? But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Why is that? If you're judged by no man. Hmm? What does that mean? For who hath known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. See, the one who judges us is the Lord. And how does the George, uh, excuse me, how does the Lord judge us? Through what is written. Is that why some of you don't read the scriptures too much? Because you're afraid of what God's going to say to you? You come up with excuse after excuse after excuse why not to spend time with the Lord, especially in these times? You think about that. And when it says here in verse 10 in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. How do you discover the judgment of the Lord? That's very simple. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Acts chapter 17, verse 11, just one verse. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, 
and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. See, they received the word with all readiness of mind. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Search the scriptures daily. Like I've told you before, I know farmers, the wife and children, who get up early in the morning and dedicate time to the Lord through prayer and reading of scripture every day, no matter the abundance of his responsibilities to his family. But he gives that to the Lord regardless, and he bears fruit. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? Verse 11 in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For it hath been declared unto me, my brethren, be, uh, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are <laughs> contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, <laughs> I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? God forbid. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 under verse 7. I think a lot of us need to remember this. Because some of us can get a little too high in, the, in their own britches. And they pontificate. I'm guilty of such myself. But remember, we are to serve one another. Serve and not lord over people. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 7. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, fleshly. Hmm. Even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, carne, carnal, fleshly, guided by the flesh. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions are ye not carnal? Oh, I'm in so-and-so's camp. Oh, I'm in so-and-so's camp. What gets into the way of being like-minded? We're, we're already kind of looking at it. Let's continue. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal, fleshly, and walk as men? Mere men. Mere men, natural men, acting foolishly, behaving foolishly, behaving as if there is no God, only taking a title upon you. And that's supposed to mean what? Just men. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> look at that. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? Mere men? As one of these lost people out there? For while one saith, and I've covered this before in other videos, I am a Paul, and another, I am of, of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? But see, insert that, well, he disagrees with me, then he must not be saved. There are many of you out there who I don't agree with of the Church of the Living God. And you don't agree with me. 
And some of you, I even know your testimony. I know how the Lord broke you and brought him and brought you onto himself. Okay? We can still, we are still brothers regardless. Okay? We can still converse. We can still be there for one another. But when you, well, I'm on this side, I'm on this side. <laughs> are you not carnal? It's getting in the way of true fellowship between brethren. You, you, you believe the same things. You speak the same. You teach the same. You witness the same. You have the same God within you. What gets in the way? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? Some of you out there, you really do put people up on pedestals. And what happens? It goes to their head. It goes to their head. When you start putting people up on pedestals, I, I've, I've had people try to do that to me. Oh, the, you devils, you, with your emails. Yes, you try to do that, don't you? Yeah, with your flattery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You try it. But see, what can happen is you got so many people praising you and praising you and praising you and praising you, praising you and praising you. It's like, oh, you must get a nosebleed up there. You're so high up, right? Then what happened? <clears throat> Lord, got to knock it down. Hi. Oh, boy. We don't got time. To, for me to indulge you of how often the Lord has kicked me down. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Remember we saw grant you to be like-minded? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Or did God give the increase? One plants, one waters, but it is God who gives the increase. It is God. This is all about our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, remember. Not about you, not about me. But you're going to do what you're going to do. And you can't tell me otherwise. <laughs> What's getting in the way there? Verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything. Who are we? Who am I? Neither he that watereth. Who are you? Oh, I'm sure you'd, you'd spend over two hours to tell me, wouldn't you? But God that giveth the increase, brethren. God that giveth the increase. Romans chapter 8. What gets in the way? What gets in the way of fellowship? What gets in the way of those being like-minded. I have, we have beautiful fellowship with the brethren whom we communicate with. Why? Because we are like-minded. Our flesh doesn't get in the way. We humble ourselves according to what the word says. And we don't put our feelings above the scriptures or our traditions above the scriptures either. What say the scriptures? That's what we hold to. And hence, beautiful, like-minded fellowship with brethren, with sisters. But there again, what gets into the way of those being like-minded? Romans chapter 8, verses 5 on to verse 11. 
We don't need to read verses 1 on to verse 4, which tells you where sin is in the skin suit, which Catholics worship, okay? But, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the capital S spirit, the things of the capital S spirit. Why do we do some of the things we do? All things are lawful unto you. But all things don't edify you, do they? Meats for the belly and belly for meats. All things are lawful for you. Yes, we can do as a church of the living God, we can do anything that they, the lost world, can do. We can. All things are lawful for you. Yeah? Remember, God, God ain't putting a gun to your head to stop you, is he? The devil ain't putting a gun to your head to force you to go along in that, is he? No. No. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, the Lord can give you joy in things that he, that he gives you to do. And uh, finding joy in the scriptures, singing hymns and fellowship with the brethren. Yes, yes, yes. But we have to remember... We are not our own. And it is a constant war with our flesh. It's an everyday struggle. I struggle every day with my pride. Every single day. It's a struggle. Because the flesh, where sin is, I want to do this. No, I want you to do this. I'm going to do it. Okay, fine. You do it, and then what happens? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So to have your mind on things on the flesh, worldly things, what does this say? It's death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Adhering your life to what God says is what? Life and peace. Why is it that some of you don't have peace? Perfect example, addiction. You're being brought under the power of things of your flesh. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And carnal, carne, fleshly. Okay, and let's look at verse 3 here in uh, Romans chapter 8. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So a mind that is centered on fleshly things, fleshly desires, carnal desires, carnal pleasures, fulfilling the desires and lusts of the mind and of the flesh. That's, what does it say? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Why can't it be? Because of verse 3. Sin has been condemned to the skin suit. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Our spirit and soul are housed within the flesh, the skin suit. Yes. So they like to argue, don't you? Well, we're, your, your spirit and soul is in the flesh. So see, we're in the flesh. Oh, so then God's word contradicts, right? Being in the flesh, meaning that you're going and fulfilling the desires and lusts of the flesh. There, dear friend. Okay? See, Paul makes a distinction in verse 5, 6, and 7. 
and says here in verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You're in the flesh when you're giving yourself over to your addiction. You're in the flesh when you're going contrary, sitting there watching a Hollywood movie, sitting there listening to uh, worldly music, sitting there indulging in worldly things. Yeah. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. See, a lot of people can fake it. But how fleshly, how carnal are they? We all have carnality at one level or another. Of course we do. Of course we do. There is no one sinlessly perfect, thank you very much. But if there's no restraint, no hesitation, no nothing, just willfully, like Oscar Wilde said, Best way to get rid of a temptation is to give into it. Blah. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's saying that now while he's in hell, right? Yeah. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Spirit of God dwell in you. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, who is the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that spirit? Okay. Now, if... Any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He is none of his. Hence, that one within you to tell you, don't do that. Don't, don't stop that. Don't, don't look. What are you doing? No, there's no restraint. There's no restraint. There's no internal conflict of having God within you. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Because we saw right here in verse 3, sin is condemned to what? The flesh. Okay? And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Whose righteousness? His. You have God within you. Perfect, holy, sinless God. God who cannot sin. God who will not lead you into sin. He will not guide you into sin. That's what John talks about in 1 John chapter uh, 3 or 4 it is, I believe. Which a lot of people like to confuse saying, well, if you're saved, you're, you won't sin anymore. No, that's talking about the Holy Ghost who is in you. The Holy Ghost will not guide you into sin, see. Okay? Okay. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So he'll strengthen, make alive your body so that you could be a vessel meet for his use. But as we've seen, Flesh is what gets in the way of people being like-minded every single time. Let's look at a really good example of that. Go to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. We want verses 36 on to verse 41. Acts chapter 15. Beg your pardon, brethren. Finally had to trim my mustn't touch you here. <laughs> you needed to know that, by the way. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 on to verse 41. And some days after, Paul said on to Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where, city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now this Mark, Marcus, Mark, this Mark was the same one who started out with them, but then after something happened, whatever, and then decided to ditch them and then to go back to Jerusalem. That's in Acts chapter 13, I believe that is. 
uh, or yeah, uh, Acts chapter 12, excuse me, Acts chapter 12, okay, where they went out, uh, Barnabas, Paul, and uh, John, whose surname was Mark, but something happened, and he retreated back to Jerusalem. He left them to deal with all that stuff, okay, he was helping them out, but he left, okay, we know that, right? And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname is Mark. Verse 38. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. Let's look at Barnabas here. Go to Luke chapter 17. Thank you. <laughs> Luke chapter 17. Verses 3 on to verse 4. Luke chapter 17. Not John 17. <laughs> Luke chapter 17 verses 3 on to verse 4. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Or ignore him and count him as uh, he doesn't exist, right? And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Hmm. Now granted, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection, but um, to someone who is your brother of the church of the living God, they keep messing up, and they say, look, I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry. You know, please forgive me. I repent. I'm sorry. We as brethren are to forgive our brothers as Christ forgave us. Okay? That, that doesn't mean that fellowship that you might have once had goes back to normal. More often than not, that means that it is permanently altered because flesh got in the way of something, whether because of you or because of someone else. Okay? But if your brother is like, look, brother, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I let my flesh get in the way. I have no, I have no excuse. I, and I make no excuse. Please forgive me. I repent. Uh, if you are of the church of the living God, you're supposed to forgive your brother. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Again, that does not mean that things go back to hunky-dory the way they were before. Way too many times in my personal life with the brethren, we've had our flesh get in the way, and it's like Paul and Barnabas, we've had to go our separate ways because we couldn't get along anymore because of fleshly reasons. Not necessarily because we weren't of a like mind, not because we didn't speak the same thing, taught the same thing, preached the same thing, Glorified the same Lord because we have the same Lord within us. No. It was flesh. It's every time. It's flesh. Unless they are not truly saved. And there are major doctrinal differences between you. That's a different story. But see, flesh gets in the way. And Barnabas, you know, hey, we don't know if Mark repented. There is some evidence that suggests, and we're going to be looking at this, there is evidence to suggest that Mark did repent, okay? There is evidence to suggest that, okay? But we, we really don't know if he did. But Barnabas, who unfortunately to my detriment, I have taken after. I have been like Barnabas. I have given chances to people who I should not have given chances to. I have forgiven people who turn around and turn out to be lost. So, yeah, I've, I've been like a Barnabas myself before. My fault, my shame, and no excuse. But see where Barnabas, I, where I think was Barnabas was coming from was exactly this. Let's give him another chance. He messed up. We don't know, according to this text, whether or not Mark repented. We will be looking at evidence that suggests that he did, but we don't know. But Barnabas like, hey, come on. 
Let's give him another chance. Also, let's look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 26 on to verse 30. And when Saul, who had just been converted, okay, Saul had just been converted. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Look at verse 27. But Barnabas, who was a Levite, the son of Constellation, took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas was the one who brought Saul at that time, who would become Paul, to the apostles. This was Barnabas. When everyone was afraid of Saul, who was the one who went out and sought him? And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Sisera and sent him forth to Tars Tarsus. Talking about Saul. Sent him away. But it was Barnabas. So Barnabas wanting to give Mark another chance. And also he was the one who brought Saul to the apostles. And while we're at that, let's look at Acts chapter 11, verses 22 on to verse 26. Okay? And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and, great, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. This is the scripture's testimony of Barnabas, by the way. For he was a good man, the scripture, talking of Barnabas. And full of the Holy Ghost, Barnabas was a saved man. And of faith. And much people was added on to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek. Saul, again. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples called themselves Christians first at Antioch. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Sorry, just had to put that in there. But then again, we uh, here again, we see. We see Barnabas looking to make peace, wanting to give Mark another chance. On two occasions, he brought Saul to the apostles. He went to Tarsus and sought him out, brought him to Antioch. Uh, go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, just one verse, verse 10. This is Paul. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salute, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. Now, later on in the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, which we are going to look at, we see that Paul will re refer on to Mark. But right here we hear of a Marcus, who is what? Sister's son to Barnabas. 
Is this in verse 37? Is this the same mark? If it is, that would mean that Barnabas was the uncle to John, whose surname was Mark. If it is. If it is. But regardless of all that, Barnabas wanted to give Mark another chance. And we looked at some scripture, especially in Luke, wanting, hey, do we know if he repented? Possibly he did. Let's go with he did, okay? But now let's... Could you see where Barnabas was coming from? Couldn't you? But let's look at Paul now. Verse 38. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Very simple. Psalm 25. Psalm 25. No. Proverb 25. Beg your pardon. Proverbs 25. One verse. Proverbs 25, verse 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. I've had I've had a broken tooth and tried to eat. Oh boy. Or a foot out of joint. Or with like my wife, a hip out of joint. Hmm. And when you look at it, when they departed for, uh, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work, Mark, John Mark, left them. So they had to do it all themselves, just he and Barnabas, which ought to have brought those two people together quite significantly. But now, go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Second Timothy chapter 4, just one verse, verse 11. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. This is Paul talking. Take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. So why would Paul call him Marcus in Colossians and just Mark here? I don't know. Like I said, I don't know. But is this the Mark, the same Mark? But see, the point is, the point is, Mark didn't go with them. Mark proved himself unfaithful. Barnabas wanted to do the right thing, so to say. Let's give him another chance. But Paul's like, no, no. See, what this is telling us is, okay, Paul might have been, and this is not in the text, but let's think about this. It's like, look, okay, yeah, I forgive him. Okay, that's good. And that's good that you want to give him a second chance. That's good. But his track record isn't so good. Barnabas has been like, well, hey, what about with you? So what happened? Because of this. And which one was the preferred opinion here? Verse 39. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. So Barnabas took Mark. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, no matter what. And sailed on to Cyprus. And of course, Proverbs 13, verse 10, just one verse. What got in the way here? What got in the way here? Proverbs 13, verse 10, one verse. <laughs> Are you looking at that? Don't look at me. Only by pride 
cometh contention. But with the well advised is wisdom. Only by pride cometh contention. Some things are better off left alone. Barnabas, even though he was, hey, you wanted to give him another chance? Paul's like, no, okay, this, okay, it's good. Yeah, good, you want to give him a whatever? No, no, okay? We can't trust him. It's too soon to trust him. If it is the same mark in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, if this is the same mark, I think it is, then we know that he later on would become profitable. But at this time, he wasn't. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed onto Cyprus. Who is the one who is doing the separating? What got in the way? Only by pride cometh contention. And how does pride come about? But look at verses 40 on to verse 41. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the grace, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria unto Cilicia, confirming the churches. So we see that Paul, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God, And when it comes to Barnabas, you don't hear much uh, of Barnabas anymore. The last mention of Barnabas is in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. And it's mentioned in a point of reference. He's mentioned in a point of reference hereafter. But we all know what became of Paul. So, in this dispute... Even though, even though we could see where Barnabas was coming from, couldn't you? Which one was the preferred opinion? Which one was recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God? What became of Barnabas? Oh yeah, you Catholics with your Apocrypha stuff. Yeah, the epistle of Barnabas. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, yeah, go away. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, verse 7 on to verse 12. I have, uh, I have quoted this on to brethren who our flesh had gotten in the way. And because of that, we've had sharp contentions. And we had to, it's like, you, okay, I've quoted this onto people, brethren, because why? Our flesh got in the way. Genesis chapter 13, verses 7 on to verse 12. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren. For we be brethren. It's like, hey, we're not going to get along. Okay? We, we, we believe the same thing. We teach the same thing. We speak the same thing. We love the same Lord because we've got the same Lord within us. But there's something there that's keeping us from being like-minded. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. 
And if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Depart from each other. That happens. That happens. And why does it happen? Between truly saved uh, brethren, sisters, why does that happen? Every single time. Because of flesh. Because of pride. Because of whatever. And Lot lifted up his eyes <laughs> and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. He lifted up his eyes and looked, saw everything just with his eyes. Looks good. Looks good. Barnabas, this looks good. Do the right thing. Let's give Mark another chance. So Paul's like, ah, wait a minute. Wait a minute there, Barnabas. Hold up. Then Lot shows him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they, de and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And, we know, and if you were to continue reading, you know that Lot went into Sodom with all kinds of stuff, but then he left with nothing at the end of it. Abram had to go rescue him. And then the Lord allowed two, uh, two angels to come and get him, his wife and his daughters out. And we all know what happened with that. So Lot, having there was a strife between them, and Lot chose the one way, which turned out pretty bad for him. And the scriptures call Lot a just man. And Peter, Peter referred to him as that just man, his, his soul being vexed with the conversation of the uh, wicked. See the comparison? But let's continue. Let's, con let's continue. Let's continue. Let's go to verse 15. I know I said on the 12, but let's go on to uh, verse 15. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him. And we remember that it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? We, we remember that, okay? And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art. Notice this, northward and southward and eastward and westward. But when it comes to Lot, hmm, he only looked in the one direction and only saw, only saw the land of Zoar, the plain and whatnot. But the Lord said, look everywhere. Isn't that interesting? Oh, kind of being uh, recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, Christ, forever. It is an unfortunate thing that those who are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, yes, it is unfortunate. You like to wonder, well, it's like, okay, we have, we're, we're, we're both apparently saved, but yet there's this problem. What is it? It's flesh. It's flesh. One accuses the other, the other accuses the other. And where does it go? It goes nowhere. One has to yield and it's like, hey, look, you, you want to do whatever you want to do, fine. You stay away from me. I'm staying away from you. That, you know, separate. Okay? The Lord today has called us all unto the ministry of reconciliation. Some he has called to do this, and some he has called to do other things. But see, when little petty squabbles get in the way, 
when flesh gets in the way, then true fellowship and being a like mind is hampered, is hindered. And on that, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 on to verse 11. Perfect example that we can learn from these Corinthians of the church of the living God. You know, you want to talk about those who are messed up of the church of the living God? You read First and Second Corinthians in their entirety. How Paul dealt with those of the church of the living God who let flesh get in the way. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 on to verse 11. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law and before the unjust and not before the saints? Those who sin rebuke before all. Yeah, yeah. But if your brother has offended you, there is that thing where you're supposed to go privately. Right? But they just want to make a name for themselves sometimes, most of the time. But see, the example is two brethren having a problem and instead of going, working it out within themselves, within the church of the living God, they go outside of that for the whole world I think you're making a big point aren't you yeah do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak this to your shame. I speak to your shame, excuse me. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? Apparently not, huh? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. And how do you judge between brethren? Being of like mind of the same judgment. But brother go to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Humble yourself. Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that's your brethren. Got to get even. You got to stir the pot when it didn't need to be stirred. But then again, remember, when pride and flesh gets in the way, what? People put themselves up here. You're not even worth my time, and that kind of stuff, right? Now there, now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters. Idolaters. And remember, idolatry is always talking about a statue, right? Please. 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 Okay? Nor adulterers, nor effeminate men acting like women, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 on to verse 14. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant 
how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual, capital R, rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, setting up idols in your heart, making something an idol. You know, remember, an idol isn't always like a little Semiramis statue. Remember that, okay? You can make an idol out of money. You can make an idol out of your house. You can make an idol out of a person. You can make an idol out of an idea, out of yourself, the one that you look at in the mirror. Idolatry. You can make an idol out of your position. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Always leave room if you're wrong. What if you are? Couldn't possibly be, right? I've been wrong on so many occasions, brethren. When I've been wrong, brethren corrected me through the scriptures. Okay? And my mistakes and errors, you can see here on the channel. You can see them. I publicly repent and confess of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. You gotta be careful. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but, sat, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. It's idolatry. Flee from it. Flee from it. Flee from idolatry. Whether you are worshiping a statue, an object, or whatever it is, yourself, we are to flee from idolatry. Be careful. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And, of course, let's, while we're in chapter 10, let's read now verses 15 on to verse 22. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for, all, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? 
What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. And not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Doing things that devils are doing. Yoking yourself up with things that say like the Vatican approves of. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the tables of and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 on to verse 18. Now, a lot of people about 2 Corinthians chapter 6 like to tie that into marriage, okay? The entire chapter is not talking, I mean, yeah, it helps to be equally yoked to your wife or husband, but absolutely. But in context, this is not talking about marriage. This is talking about fellowship. You know, we are to prefer one another of the church of the living God. But see, when our flesh gets in the way and it's not settled with the word, like-mindedness. Paul wants us to be like-minded. He admonishes us to be like-minded. But what gets in the way? Flesh. Every single time. Every single time. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Seth the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, Seth the Lord Almighty. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. See, we can't be of like mind with someone who is not of our own. We are to prefer our own. And we are, when amongst our own, we are to be like-minded. But not at gunpoint, unfortunately, right? And not to stay away at gunpoint. But what gets in the way every single time is flesh. Either or. And when you're someone who is hardly ever wrong... <laughs> It's better to just be like, okay, bow out. All right, all right, dude. All right, dude. You want to be like that? Fine. Fine. Good luck. Yay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Go away. Go away. Yeah. Don't let the door hit you in the buttocks on the way out there. Yeah. See you in heaven. See you in heaven. And up there, this nonsense will be over with. We won't have to deal with it. But right now, because our spirit and soul are within the skin suit where sin has been condemned to. Okay? That's why, you know, people, lost people, how come all you guys don't get along? You know what I say? I do, I do this. Because of this. Your arm? No, no, you know, you, the flesh. Every single time. Every single time. If there are disputes about doctrine, 
and about disputes of doctrine comes about this fellowship. Then that is when this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 applies. But when two brothers or two sisters who have the same spirit but yet can agree on trivial things, flesh gets in the way. Or don't agree on things, on courses of action that aren't necessarily according to God's desire. What happens? Flesh gets in the way every single time. That's why Paul tells us to put down, to mortify our flesh. To put it down. Okay? And that's a struggle. And that's a struggle. It's a daily struggle. That's a daily struggle. Go to Philippians. We're going to spend the rest of our time together in Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 on to verse 30. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 on to verse 30. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent. I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for, for the faith of the gospel. What it all gets down to at the end of the day, we need to be out there as long as the Lord allows preaching the gospel edifying the body of Christ, the church of the living God, but being witnesses for our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, in that, being witnesses unto our Lord, what does he say? That you stand fast in one spirit. You can only do that if you're saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel the end of the day, preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 1 under verse 6. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But what happens when someone who's got a little bit of an ego problem wants to come in and stir things up? Is that you? Is that me? Huh? Let's examine ourselves, brethren. Sisters, okay? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all? Really? One God and Father of all, who is above all and through you all. One God who's in you all? God in you? What does that mean? Oh, let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Look at that. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Those who are saved, who have the Spirit of Christ. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. Okay? Uh, what is this? Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 on to verse 21. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I 
but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, the works of the law, what you do, okay, then Christ is dead in vain. Hmm. And Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 on to verse 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. Once saved, always saved. You come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and fear of the Lord, call upon his name. Which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption, that's the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. And, you know, while we're in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, let's look at verses 29 on to verse 32. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not that, uh, excuse me, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, see that capital S, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness. And what happens when a root of bitterness gets into you? Uh, it defiles you. And wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And in doing that, like I said, that doesn't mean that every single time that happens, that you go right back to hunky-dory, mushy-gushy fellowship that you had before. Doesn't mean that. Like I said, it usually means the opposite. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So we see Christ living in you and the Holy Ghost living in you. And we already read about how uh, I will dwell in them. Okay, talking about the Father. Who is the Father? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, go to John 14. John 14. Always take a moment to uh, exhort God as he truly is. One God. Comprised of spirit, soul, and body. One God. John 14, verses 15 on to verse 21. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot re receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, that at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, excuse me, and ye in me, and I in you. Really? He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. John 16, verses 13 on to verse 15. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, 
He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said that he shall take of mine, and shall shew it unto you. Hmm. So, wait a minute. Wait a minute. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all? You have the Father living within you if you are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God? So you have the Father who is our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. One verse, read the whole context on your own time. Read the whole chapter. Now, the Lord, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, liberty. Yes, we do have liberty as the church of the living God. We're not bound by sin. We have the Lord within us who can quicken our mortal bodies. Without the Lord, you have no hope against sin. You're going to sin as a church of the living God. Absolutely. Absolutely, you are. You can't get away from that. That's impossible. Why? Because sin has been condemned in the flesh and your spirit and soul are within your flesh. So you're going to sin. But see, without the Lord within you, you, you have no power, none, to do anything against sin. You can't, because you have no power within from the Lord himself. God the Father dwelling within you, see. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. You're not bound by sin as you are, not being saved. Galatians chapter 5. Verses 11 unto the close of the chapter. Beg your pardon, brethren. Galatians chapter 5, verses 11 unto verse 26. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So if one is preaching circumcision, that means that they are preaching the law, being under the law, like a lot of the Hebrew roots people do, and these black Israelites do, uh, the Lordship Salvation crowd, okay? And also, if you're preaching circumcision, okay, which means preaching the law, also being legalistic, Okay, I have, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, circumcision came of the law. And if I yet preach circumcision, the law, or being legalistic, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Ah, the offense of the cross because Christ is crucified in you and you are crucified onto the world. I can't tell you how many times my wife and I have been out in public not even doing anything. People, ooh. Like I said to our best friend, it's like, yeah, I, I don't wear a pit putty. <laughs> so that could be it. <laughs> but you know, see, God the Father living within you exudes himself. And we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I just butchered that and bradized that. Ephesians 6, 12, beg your pardon. But uh, it's a spiritual battle, not a fleshly one. And the, the spirit of this world, which is the spirit, which is that spirit of antichrist, recognizes the spirit of God, the Father within those of those of who are his. They really do. 
And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, the law, or legalism, why do I yet suffer persecution? That is the offense of the cross cease. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called on to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Okay, you know, if you don't like to mark in your scriptures, take your little pen, okay? Circle this verse, underline it, you know, get get one of uh, one of one of these things, you know, the gel things, highlight it. Okay? Highlight it. For brethren, ye ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is filled is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, what's the opposite of that? Being led by your flesh. Ye are not under the law. See, but if you're led of your flesh, you're under the law. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Yeah. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Oh, witchcraft. Oh, I forgot one, didn't I? Idolatry. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because they are fleshly. They are carnal. And the carnal mind is enmity against God. Neither is it subject to the law of God, or word of God, excuse me, or can be. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And it's not the sappy, saccharine, sweet thing. No. True love has its ground and foundation in truth. You know, we are the church of the living God, the ground and pillar of truth, okay? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Glory that's not going to... The worship of men. How can ye believe if ye receive honor from men and not receive the honor that cometh from God only? How can ye believe? Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. I want to provoke you on the good works. I want to provoke you to search in the scriptures daily whether these things are so. I want to provoke you to fulfill whatever it is the Lord wants you to do. Because time is short. And we don't know when we are going to be caught up. 
I believe and hope and pray it's soon, but we don't know, do we? Do we? Now, going back to Philippians, because I closed the scriptures where I was at. Philippians chapter 1. Now, let's read verse 29. Or uh, we, we stopped at verse 27. That's why, uh, let's, let's continue again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. See, if I preach circumcision or legalism, why the persecution? If you preach law, the law or legalism, why do you suffer persecution? And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. As I said, God who lives in you exudes himself through you. Ought to. Ought to. And that spirit of Antichrist that is in this world, the spirit of this world, recognizes one that isn't their own. Happens all the time. Happens to us all the time. Not because of an outer adornment. No. But because of an inner conversion, a new creature. Verse 28. Again. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of uh, perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. Looking at verse 29, 2 Timothy chapter 2, Verses 10 on to verse 13. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake. That is not the Calvinism elect thing of election. No. The elect. The way of the cross. The way of the church and the living God. That is what God has chosen. God has chosen the way of the cross. So when he says elect's sake, he's talking about those of the church of the living God who came to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, called upon the name of the Lord, and he saved them, okay? That's the elect that's being talked about, okay? Not this Calvinistic, you're going to hell whether you can help it or not, or you're going to go to heaven whether you help it, can help it or not, or even want to. It's none of that stuff. No, that's nonsense, okay? Let's continue. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, dead to the world and to ourselves, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And of course, this denying is not talking about denying our salvation. We've already looked at it. You're sealed unto the day of redemption if you are truly saved, born again, and converted of the church of the living God. Okay? You're sealed unto the day of redemption. If we deny him, and if we deny him when, we, when he puts a, a circumstance together, he'll deny us. Blessing, grace, mercy, provision, not salvation. See, when you are saved, born again, converted to the church of the living God, a new creature in Christ Jesus, you're going to heaven. You're going to heaven. No matter how much your flesh gets into the way, you're going to go to heaven, okay? If you are truly saved. But see, if we deny him, he will deny us down here in blessing, grace, mercy, kindness, whatever. Salvation? No. Or else he'd be a liar. God's no liar, okay? If we believe not, yet is he yet he abideth faithful. 
He cannot deny himself because we are part, part of his bones and of his flesh. We are the body of Christ. We are what is hindering that man of sin, the son of perdition, from being revealed. He who now letteth will let until he, the body of Christ, the church of the living God, be taken out of the way. And then that wicked shall be revealed, that man of sin, the son of perdition. Okay? Now, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, also verses 10 on to verse 13. Paul talking to Timothy, of course. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Godly, separate, other than that. And yes, someone can bring, you know, someone can have a changed life and do it themselves. But those of us who are truly saved, it's because we are a new creature. Because we are converted. We are saved. I'm a new creature. What about you? Remember, people can have a changed life. You can change many things and still be as lost as the day is long. But are you a new creature? But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And back to Philippians chapter 1, verse 30. Having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. Hmm. And for that, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 on to verse 9. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock, being lords over God's heritage, being a Nicolaitan, you know, ruling like Catholics do, ruling over the laity, like these Christians in these church buildings, Diotrephes, who love to have the preeminence, who like to pontificate, Okay? An admonition for us not to be like that. We are servants. We don't lord it over people. You go to these buildings, that's all they do. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You're casting everything upon him when you humble yourself. See, because there's nothing in you that you can do to save yourself. You don't take tactics of manipulation to do things. You depend on the Lord. You throw everything. You humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Continuing the train of thought in a different verse. Casting all your care upon him. 
for he careth for you. All our care is upon the Lord. Whether we eat, whether we sleep, whether we have electricity, whether we can, whether we can do this, you know, whatever, whether we can pay the bills, that is on the Lord. We put it all upon him. All our care is upon him because we humble ourselves before him. What about you, brother, sister? Be sober. Be right in the head. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You're not alone in your suffering. You're not alone in living separate other than that and being persecuted for it. You're not alone. We of the church of the living God who seek to live godly according to the scriptures, we suffer persecution daily. Don't we? Don't we? Now, let's go to sec uh, second. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Verses 1 under verse 8. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort in love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, look at the ifs there, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of, in the Spirit, of the Spirit, excuse me, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, being of one accord. Those whom I have fellowship personally, my, me and my wife with person, personally, we are of one accord. We are of one mind, okay? We have the same love. We are like-minded. We think the same. Our best friend, Alexander Hartley, I, we finish each other's sentences. Uh, my brother from Australia, when we get together, the Lord just opens the scriptures to both of us and produces, okay? Brother from Northeast, nothing but love and edification between us. My brother from the Northwest, also the same thing. My brother from Alabama, same thing. Why? We are of one accord. We are of one mind. We are like-minded. But as we have already looked at, only by pride cometh contention. And pride cometh because of what? Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. I am a sinner who is chief. I'm worse than you are. And it's a miracle. It's nothing but God's grace, his kindness, that he has saved me. And has called me to such a calling as this. Made it obvious. We are to serve one another, not serve ourselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which also, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 on to verse 18. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. See, that's the freedom that we get in Christ Jesus. We are no longer in bondage to the devil. Okay? That's the freedom. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Lord willing, that's going to be the next video. The seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham, which he chose. That line of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, unto Abraham is attributed the first mention of Hebrew. Okay? Or Abram, one of the two. The same man, okay? But that line of the Hebrews is, number one, of Shem, not of Ham, okay? But the line of the Hebrews comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the line of the Hebrew, of Shem. That's why there are those who are of Shem, but are not Hebrews, okay? But, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Yes, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, and I already explained this in a video, he is able to succor, help them that are tempted. Okay? And 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest. Okay, see, look at that. God was manifest in the flesh. It wasn't God was flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Flesh is not God, Catholic. Okay? Flesh is corruptible. Flesh is sinful. Okay? God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Go back to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Now let's read verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Verses 21 on to verse 24. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an ensample, I love that word, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth. Again, God can't sin. Okay. The word never sinned. The word is Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Some of you devils there think you're so brilliant. Can't figure that one out. I wonder why. Okay. But let's continue. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he re was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. Whose by, who, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now 
Return unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Charity. Self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. Not this, oh, I, I, this is something that I got to do just because I, I have to. It's a willful choice. Not to glorify yourself, but out of love for the body of Christ, for the church of the living God, our brothers and sisters, you forsake your own self that you may give to, unto others. Like I've told you before, whatever gift you have of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that spirit, is not meant to be hoarded, but to be given unto others, to be shared, to be a source of edification for the church of the living God, and to be a burr under the saddle to those who are lost and reject the truth of the word. It's meant to be shared. Self-sacrifice. Charity. Now, let's look at charity. See, those who are ecumenical, who preach the satanic love gospel, will come to 1 Corinthians 13 and try to twist that and say, see, God loves everybody. Excluding truth. Truth offends. Okay? You know we're called to be salt of the earth? Salt purifies. But salt burns. Okay? We are to be salt. Okay? But see, when these love gospel heretics come to 1 Corinthians, don't judge the sin. Love everybody. For go, don't look. Uh, remember, uh, judge the sin, not the sinner. Where is that written, please? Yeah, see, the love gospel heretic, the ecumenical heretic, comes to this and twists it on its head, say, don't judge. Don't judge. But we as the church of the living God amongst ourselves are to deny ourselves and to live for others. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, self-sacrifice. You can love all the... <laughs> Tis the month of December, right? You can love all the wrong things. You can make an idol out of all the law, wrong things. You can love all the wrong things. Like these, uh, these uh, Unitarians. Love is love. No. You run into love is love. What does that mean? That it's okay to be a sodomite? No. No. It's charity. Charity denies self. Let's read. <laughs> Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have become a, a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. There's a little big difference. Nice isn't in the scriptures. Kindness is. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Fail! mean not come to pass? When do prophecies not come to pass? 
What are prophecies for today? Prophesying today is someone who has the Lord within them speaking to you through the scriptures. Okay, that's what 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 6 is talking about. Okay, those who prophesy, you prophesying to you, the Lord within me speaking to you through the scriptures. That is prophesying today. So when it says, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail? Do the prophecies of our Lord fail? No. Will there come a time when the church of the living God is not on earth? Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. So prophecies will fail. Meaning, there'll be also a time when people will not hear, will not endure a sound doctrine. Gee whiz, you don't say, right? Yeah. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Languages, okay? Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. We're not perfect. We are not perfect. There is no, even though some of you would like to think so, there is no such thing as a perfect preacher. That one uh, Jesuit, Martin Richling, used to preach that, that he pre preached 100% pure, perfect doctrine. Never forgot that. Yeah. Oh, what now do we all, per uh, what do we preach? 100% perfect, pure doctrine? Hmm? Are we preaching perfectly? Is there not something that every preacher has some kind of little tink in? What are you, Christ? Christ is in you, yes. If you are saved, born again, converted out of the church of the living God. But guess what? Hello, cousin. I make mistakes. You can see them. Why? Because I don't have an infallible understanding. I am fallible. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. It's not that we don't give people the whole truth. We do. Uh, there is no man out there that can rightly say they understand the entirety of Scripture. John MacArthur likes to tell you that he does. Okay? Absolutely. And even the late Peter Ruckman tried to strongly suggest that he did. Guys like that, who know way too much for their own good. Okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Guys like that have always scared me. That they know way, way so, like everything it seems, right? Careful of that. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, and we're not perfect, by the way. Who is perfect? But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Some of you out there, I <laughs> just really need to grow up. Really need to grow up. Hi, I speak of myself. I let my childish temper get the best of me sometimes too. You know, I'm uh, 47 years of age. And there are still unfortunately things that will make a six-year-old laugh will make me laugh. But some of us really need to grow up. Hi. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. We will have all the answers eventually when we are with the Lord. And now abideth, abideth, remains. Faith, hope, hope in what? To be redeemed, 
hoping on our Lord Jesus Christ, charity, self-sacrifice. But the greatest of these is charity. I don't know if you can hear that, but it sounds like things are on the, uh, on the, up in the, upstairs. One second, brethren. Sorry, brethren. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, my wife is playing with Zena, so. <laughs> so, now let's go finally to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And this is where we will end it. Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 on to verse 21. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, sinlessly perfect, no, perfect in heart, serving the Lord, speaking the same thing, being of one mind, having fellowship one with another through the Spirit, let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. He sure will. That's why you need to examine yourselves daily. That's why you need to examine yourselves every single day in the scriptures to see where, where you are wrong. And then when you run across people who um, just, well, I'm right no matter what. Okay, okay, bye. See you later. <laughs> Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. I love that word. <laughs> what gets in the way of like-mindedness again? For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now even tell you weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, things of this world. And hold your place here. On that, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17, on to verse 20. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, their own flesh. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple, by good words and fair speeches. Beware philosophy. Beware lest anyone spoil you through philosophy. For your obedience is come unto all, uh, for your obedience is come abroad unto all men. And I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple. Concerning evil. It is simple. What's concerning evil? If it isn't in here, it's evil. And if it's in here as something that is marked as evil, it's evil. God says, thou shalt not. Guess what? That means thou shalt not. Okay? Simple. Simple. This is silent on nothing. The scriptures is silent on nothing. And if you say that the silent that the scriptures are silent on anything, on anything, you're a heretic. You're a heretic. You say the scriptures are silent on something. Well, it doesn't mention it specifically. 
Okay, you're right. But what is the root of it? See, that, that's what a lot of you don't want to get at. You know, computer fraud, mo money laundering, tax evasion, stuff like that. Stuff that isn't specifically mentioned. Okay. But what are the roots of those? It's mentioned in scripture. Scripture is silent on nothing. I, I know that, uh, oh, what was that? Uh, Philip Johnson? Not the charismatic wing, uh, one guy uh, with like the wings in his head or whatever. Um, what's his um, Philip Johnson or something like that, uh, who is associated to uh, John MacArthur. I remember hearing that guy. Well, there are certain things that, this, that uh, he said that the Bible is totally silent on. Says nothing of it. <laughs> wow. When you got someone saying stuff like that, brethren, you get away from them. Okay? You get away from them. It's in here somewhere. God hasn't revealed it unto you, then God hasn't revealed it unto you. But it's in here somewhere. Beware of people who say, imply that Scripture is silent on anything. Oh, and people will get really technical. I've seen this. I've encountered this uh, about abortion. Abortion is murder. Okay? Well, when the embryo has this or when it does this at this certain stage of life, it's like, dude, dude, <laughs> give it up. Abortion is murder. It's evil. Okay? You didn't answer. No, the root of your thing is you're trying to justify murder, abortion. Then they, it comes back. Perfect. I've, I've encountered this recently, too. Uh, I've encountered this. Yeah, it comes back. You're pro-abortion. It's the woman's right. No, it isn't. But like I said, then they'll get really, really technical. about well, duh, 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 duh. Shut up. The root is what you're getting at is you want to justify murder. You want to justify abortion. God has made it simple. Very simple. Very, very simple, okay? Very simple. In Romans chapter 16 again, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Philippians chapter 3. Picking up at verse 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, which is corruptible, which is <laughs> contaminated with sin, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And that is the ultimate goal, brethren. That is the ultimate goal. We are going to be going home. Whether we die now or we get caught up, we are going to be going home. I pray soon. I believe soon. I could be very wrong about that. I hope not, but I do believe so. But we as a church of the living God, number one, you got to know for sure that you are saved. And number two, you got to got to trust on the Lord. We're going to be redeemed, caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Your inheritance is with our Lord. And when it comes to being of like mind, I do wish... I long that we could all get along. And I've, I've encountered people who I believe are saved of the church and living God, but our flesh got in the way of each other. And hence, we went, we split asunder. Okay? And hey, you know, to those, it, to the, you know, to those whom it concerns, I, look, I have a pride problem. And if I've offended you, I, I apologize. I'm sorry. I repent. 
Uh, please forgive me. Uh, for those of my brethren, okay? Flesh gets in the way. But you know what? You got to you got to move on. You got to, you know, like, look, okay. Okay, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I repent. Forgive me. Okay, let's get on with our lives. Let's move on. We got big fish to fry. Okay, bigger fish. And we can't be sidetracked so easily as we have been. Still a war going on out there, brethren. Are you fighting it or too busy fighting amongst yourselves? And like I said, I wish we could all get along. And brethren, if you have people in your lives who you are, whom you have that like-mindedness with, praise the Lord for it. We have been blessed to have several, many, who we are like-minded with. Praise the Lord. But unfortunately, not everybody is going to get along. Why? Because of this. So um, that's going to be it for this video. Remember charity, brethren, self-sacrifice. It's not about you. It's not about you or what you want to do. And we have freedom. We are not bound by Satan to be bound by our sins. We have freedom. Yes, we do. But don't use your liberty as a cloak of covetousness that it may serve the flesh. Please don't do that. So That's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. We love you. Thank you. Thank you to those of you of the Church of the Living God who the Lord has stirred to give unto our necessities. It is because, it is because of the Lord through you that keeps us doing this, that keeps us where we are. Make your part. The Lord through you provides for our necessities. And we thank you for it. And you know who you are. And we love you. Excuse me. <laughs> but that's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much. We love you. And Lord willing, hopefully, the next video will be <laughs> Abraham Seed, which will be a two-part expository video uh, about that. Uh, but we will see what the Lord will have done. So, thank you, brother. We love you. And we will see you in the next video.